Okay. Uh, next speaker is, um, is Nelson Ekani. He's from Stockholm Environment Institute. He's been working in Rwanda, and he will be addressing the topic um, community-based sanitation programs, and he's been working in a district called uh, Barrera. Um, I believe he's, he's also um, doing his PhD and uh, using some of the, uh, the data from, from these projects. So there's, a, if you like, an extreme level of rigor in, in his uh, treatment of, of this, um, this subject. Please. Thank you, Anu. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I will share with you uh, some uh, findings we've had from uh, work we've been doing in uh, northern Rwanda. This is just to present to you, I mean, the structures that are already in place uh, before CAC is uh, institutionalized in Rwanda. And these are structures that I think will be very useful as we roll out CACs. So uh, there are different uh, entry points in sanitation, like Julian mentioned. You know, sanitation is cross-cutting. Um, in uh, many parts in Burkina Faso, in Niger, even in Rwanda now, we have the agricultural sector as an entry point. So you're having this reuse aspect as a way of uh, triggering people to get toilets so they can actually get, uh, um, you know, incentives for, for using uh, improved toilets. So where are we? Borea district in Rwanda is uh, the most rural district, densely populated, and it, of course, administratively, Rwanda has district sectors and then cells, and then you have villages at the end. So we are preci precisely at the Rugarama sector in that district, where agriculture is the predominant activity, 95%, and the major crop produced there is potato. We have uh, the volcanic region as well. It's, it's very hilly and rocky, difficult to dig toilets. And there we have predominantly peat uh, traditional peat latrines. As of uh, 2006, the sanitation coverage in that district was about 37 percent. That's based on the wash uh, survey that was done there. So those are the kind of toilets that you have there. So that, there you go. That's Burera district. And uh, we are there close to the Burera Lake. And you see this is what is predominant. And then you have some of these uh, public UD toilets, urine diversion toilets, that's how we refer to them. And then you have some of improved structures that are also coming up. So, um, yeah, after saying uh, that agriculture is, uh, is a driver, uh, Rwanda has made, as of 2011, a guideline, as you see there, made by the Ministry of Infrastructure, that's outlining the different types of structures that are usable in Rwanda, and one of them is urine diversion dry toilets, including reuse. And that's also something that uh, facilitates people in this region who are mainly considered as vulnerable to be able to use toilets uh, that are functional. And as you can see there, you can't dig so deep, so it's very rocky, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. So um, in 2006, as part of the WASH program, uh, UNICEF in, in, intervened in this area and uh, rolled out FAST, that is participatory hygiene and sanitation transformation training. And uh, we can consider this as one of those uh, triggering factors that made you know, villagers uh, in some of these communities to, to you know, create uh, Cooperatives, you see there. There are two cooperatives that I will be talking about today. The Dusukure Fast Cooperative, which uh, helps the poor households access human manure, that is it's mainly an eco san, as we call it, ecological sanitation cooperative, collects urine and feces and sanitizes the products, and of course, build eco san toilets. And their ob objectives is to maintain sanitation and hygiene facilities in the village, promote the use of sanitized human excreta in agriculture. And there's also this uh, Duha, Duharani Isuku, Isuku is Hygiene Cooperative, which was also created, which is uh, responsible for maintenance of public uh, facilities. But I'll be focusing mainly on Dusukure Fast, which is an ecological sanitation cooperative. So in 2006 and uh, uh, following that, uh, that period, 
UNICEF has been rolling out fast training uh, amongst community members of TOTs, uh, training of trainer co courses, who uh, uh, come out and then roll out this training to uh, the rest of the communities. And there's also fast committees within these communities. And uh, of course, there's a district wash team to support these uh, committees. At schools, we have what they call HAMS, Hygiene uh, and Isemang So it's, uh, it's, it's what they use in schools. And there's also committees in schools that are in charge of this. And the UNICEF also facilitated the communities by donating uh, some material. Uh, donated UD slabs, urine diversion dry uh, toilet slabs, urine pipes and jerry cans to some households. And uh, what we'll see later on is that most of the households that got it did not uh, build the toilets, um, as we'll see later. So uh, this cooperative uh, since 2007-2008 has been led by two dynamic uh, people, mainly Everest there and Jacqueline. We were part of the TOT that was rolled out. They are considered champions and, and have been used as good, ex good examples in the community. There are mainly female members in this cooperative, and there's a membership fee. So you see the type of toilets they have. We have uh, double alternating vaults. There you see there's one vault here, and there's another one. When this one is full, then they, they transfer to this one. And then you have single vaults, which are just like this. And then you have the public uh, uh, urine diversion dry toilets that have several volts. And there are also baskets that they use sometimes because it's, it's cheaper to get these baskets uh, for collection and transportation, which are sold locally. And they've also organized themselves in, in a way that they can actually sell and buy uh, these, these products. So you see there that uh, they sell urine in jerry cans and they sell volts of uh, fika compost. And the crops that they produce in this, uh, in this community, potato, of course, there's maize and there's cabbage. So to understand uh, exactly what agricultural inputs are used in this community, we, we, we did, a, as part of a survey, a household sanitation survey, we found that uh, a potato, of course, is uh, the main crop, and there is quite a lot of animal and chemical manure being used there. Uh, human human excreta, as you see there. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Human excreta is, is, is being used as well, but uh, quite minimal. Um, of maize, you see also that uh, it's animal, animal only, predominant, predominant, uh, is predominant, and you have a lot of uh, 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 human excreta also being used. So this sh shows us that there is a uh, different combination of, of fertilizers that are being used in the community uh, by different farmers. For cabbage, you see that there is more of human excreta used as fertilizer, and there's also uh, animal manure, which uh, is predominant, as well as beans. Animal manure is uh, predominant there, and there is also a mixture of chemical and uh, animal manure uh, being used, and a little bit of human uh, manure. We, as part of this survey also, we did uh, collect information about income, income and expenditure on toilets. And we found that uh, in those households with ECOSAN, the income is significantly higher. Total expenditure is significantly higher among Burera crop members, uh, cooperative members, than among Burera peat latrine members. As you can see there, this uh, blue. We also did a similar survey in uh, Kabale in Uganda, where we found that those having urine diversion dry toilets also had higher expenditure on toilets and higher uh, income. And the income is significantly higher among Kabale Ekosan households than among Kabale Pid Latrine households. And the total capital expenditure is significantly higher among Kabale. So you see there from this data that we, we have an ex higher expenditure in households having urine diversion toilets and the possibility of reuse than those with pit latrines. So that that's shows that they have been able to use the, the benefits they derive from this uh, activity to improve their 
standards. We also looked at the governance at the household level, and looking at uh, how gender division of labor is organized. We find that uh, in Burera, in Rwanda, you see that men in the cooperative households are more often involved in cleaning. And also women in Ecosan households are more, more take part in construction. So you see that those, those activities that are um, you know, perceived as male dominated, often uh, 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 women are also doing that construction, for example, and cleaning, which is a female thing. Male are also doing it in the cooperative household, which is part of a, you know, the outcome of the training that uh, took place in the community. Uh, the same thing in Kabale, we, s we also find that men in the Kabale coastal households participate in toilet cleaning as well. And uh, that is an interesting uh, thing. As you can see there, it's uh, cleaning. You see the, the more male here than in, in pit latrine households. So that's just data to show you that we've been looking at different trends in this community that is comparing, of course, Ecosan households with uh, pit latrine households. And we find there are significant differences in different activities and costs. So um, after mentioning some of these uh, champions in the community who have been behind some of these changes that have been talked a lot about in the Borea district, we uh, find that there are three people, Jacqueline, Everest and Beatrice, who have been uh, leading this cooperative and who have actually seen a lot of changes in their living standards. Jacqueline here has been able to construct a home. Uh, she didn't have a house before. This is a compound. Most of uh, this is a UD toilet behind there. And she has uh, uh, actually all kinds of crops, maize, beans, and, and all, all not there. And she is uh, one of those success stories that is documented. Everest is also one of them. And then there is Beatrice, who is also a success story. So these are cases, uh, three cases out of many that I want to show you as testimonies of this. Another uh, interesting recognition was the invitation that they got to exhibit their products at the Africa Sign <coughs> uh, conference in 2011. So they came along with, uh, with crops that are fertilized with human excreta and was, this was ex exhibited all through Africa Sign in Kigali. So these uh, cooperative faces challenges. Uh, as I said, they were trained in fast and other methods, but uh, with, with productive sanitation, it's not enough just to, to, to learn about hygiene. It's a whole system. And uh, possibly they had given them the tools, but they didn't give them enough. So there was inadequate support to the Ecosan households, in an inadequate understanding of the concept as a whole. It's a system, and uh, you can see the structure of that some of the households got. Uh, this is supposed to be a urine diversion toilet without a roof. And, uh, and this is another one. And you can see here that there is a urine correction that is uh, poorly connected. So you see from some of the households that they didn't understand very well what, what they were doing. Some complain of in, in, uh, inefficient jer uh, insufficient jerry cans, insufficient wood ash to, to, to add in toilets, so you have odor that comes and some complain also of blocked urine pipes. Um, our, our partners in Kigali, that is uh, School of Medicine and Health Sciences, uh, the former Kigali Health Institute, have been doing uh, studies in this community. And they find that there is, uh, after testing some of the samples from these toilets, they find there, there's a lot of pathogens in there. So which means that uh, this treatment is not sufficient, as you see. Uh, in 2006, 2007, that's when the intervention in the wash intervention took place in the community. And you see that there was a decrease there. And then there's a slight increase here as well in 2009. Now, we don't know if this increase is as a result of maybe uh, poor, poor usage of uh, the Ecosan uh, uh, products, but it shows there that there is a slight increase. and. Uh, that confirms also with the kind of toilets we saw and the kind of treatment uh, that they have because people start using this thing indiscriminately when they start seeing the products you know, the, the of in, their, uh, in their farms. Because the crops actually do well, cabbages are growing bigger, the maize are growing taller and so on. And so people scoop uh, uh, fecal matter that is not fully 
sanitize and use in the farms. And that's a common practice in the community. And that's what we have to actually support uh, them with. So in terms of recommendation, we think the cooperative uh, needs sustained support uh, in terms of information and tools, which I think are not sufficient uh, after being in the community since 2011. Uh, they are dynamic, as we see. Uh, there's a change, there's a recognition even uh, within Rwanda. And it's, I think it's the kind of dynamism that they show, I think the CHCs will, will strive in, in a community of that kind. Uh, we should encourage communities of this kind uh, to, to, of course, create cooperatives uh, with common vision, um, self-help groups and so on. And of course, the champions in the community, we have to identify them because Jacqueline, for example, every year, these are people who could, who could mobilize the whole community. And they are very key in uh, making things happen in these communities. So that's uh, the short uh, presentation I had to share with you. I will welcome some questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time for one or two questions. Please, you have to come up here. Yep. Just say who you are. Thank you, sir. Uh, good presentation, thank you. Um, I'm Irshad uh, Wadfala, I'm from South Africa. I'm actually completing my master's in sustainable development at Uppsala University, but I'm also a strategy consultant uh, for business development in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, just a question firstly, in terms of the yields on the produce using uh, traditional uh, methods of fertilization with, with human excreta, that's the first question. And the second question is, you mentioned the pathogens which have been found in, in some of the produce or in the soil. Um, is there a, a carryover from those pathogens into the agricultural produce? If yes, wh what are the impacts of that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. There, there is uh, the possibility that people get uh, con consume uh, uh, pathogens uh, if crops are not properly cooked or washed. And in a community of this kind where water is uh, a limiting factor, um, and uh, the hygiene habits are not the best, you find that people, of course, will, will be easily contaminated. So but there is uh, uh, what we call the multiple barrier approach, where even if you grow crops uh, you know, with fecal matter, you can actually treat them somehow. You, you wash them and you cook them and so on. But you cannot you know, assure uh, that this, this kind of uh, you know, strategies are taking place in a community of this kind. So there is a risk, and not that the, crop, the, the pathogens will go into the crops, like uh, the perception is in some of the communities that you're consuming fecal matter, but the fact that you fertilize them, and then you have the, some of the pathogens still on, uh, you know, for example, vegetables that are consumed raw. So aspects of washing, aspects of cooking are very key in uh, making sure that you reduce the risk of contamination. And uh, how about the yields, yeah, I've asked. Yeah, the yields, the, the yields are, are clear. You know, people in the, the, this community testify. They show you crops, they show you farms. They've done demonstration farms where you, you find crops that are fertilized. You saw there was a, that's, there was a wide, wide variety of, of uh, fertilizers used, as you saw there. But they have done different demonstrations to show that human excreta actually is, uh, is producing better than the others. And you could see on cabbage, big and uh, fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, one question. Come on. My name is My name is Grietje Zeeman, Wageningen University, the Netherlands. Mm. Um, actually, my question is related to uh, the former questions on pathogens. Um, twofold, uh, it's known from yeah, practice and literature, especially here in Sweden, that when you store urine that the pathogens are going back to zero. Um, is that promoted, that the urine is first stored before uh, applied? And secondly, do you also advise on the type of excreta, so urine or or uh, feces for certain products? Because I can imagine that when you use uh, uh, tomatoes, which grow high, then it's better to use the, the um, feces because they will not get into contact 
with the with the products. So I think you can improve there quite a lot. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there are guidelines, the WHO guidelines that uh, you know stipulate things like that. Uh, there's also a urine guideline that SCI has done, which you know outlines the procedure of how to apply urine and uh, on what crops and what quantity. But there is, in a community of this kind, you need to be there, which actually was not the case there. They have very little support from the WASH team. So they, most of the things they do on their own, and they, they, they need some coordination. They've, uh, when they, once they start seeing that this thing is, is very productive, they will do what they can to, to actually improve their yield. So it's actually important for, for you know, practitioners to be on the ground with, with the community members uh, you know, to monitor their, be their, their behavior for a while, because it started nicely and then it, it changed. And as I hear, as of uh, last week, I was with uh, one of the, the people from KHI, former KHI, and he said the government authorities actually are turning down the whole thing. So it, it means that they, they may be seeing some of the, the negative part of it and they want to shut it down. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a bit of a... Um, I'd say it's quite a bit of ignorance actually about this thing about pathogens. If you if you have a community sharing um, feces that are either composted or not composted, then you get cross transfer of pathogens, which can be foreign, which can cause uh, some form of disease. Within a family plot, though, there is already a cross contamination. If you're a, like a lone farmer, you don't you can't get sick on your own feces. So there's a lot of um, unknowns about these sorts of things. But the WHO has done a great service 2006 to say that, um, that uh, urine storage should be for a community um, up to six months, uh, depending on the temperature. So uh, in fact, I think now it's um, in practice going down to two months. Urine is, is not the source of pathogens, of course. It's rather sterile. Um, and that's where most of the nutrients yeah, are. So. If it's not cross-contaminated, of course. So, uh, thank you, Nelson, for that.